everybody. Uh, this is Dominic Deli Carpini. I am uh, the Dean of the York College Center for Community Engagement, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the fourth in this series on the foundations of democracy. Uh, today, we'll be talking about democracy and power, having over the last three days had conversations about democracy and rhetoric, democracy and the protection of our ego by Dr. Randy uh, Sulowski Shoemaker, and the conversation about the possible lessons of history uh, related to democracy and anti-democracy by Kay McAdams. They've all been terrific presentations and I thank my colleagues for the work on that. Today we'll hear from Vinnie Canazero, who's the director of the Arthur J. Gladfelter Institute for Public Policy here at the CCE. He also directs the Masters of Public Policy Administration program here. Maybe do a little commercial for that, Vinnie, in the midst of this. Uh, Vinnie's research is largely tied to promoting and expanding issues of equity and democratizing the public policy process. Along the way, use the chat function to, to put in some questions as they occur to you. And at the end, Vinnie will address some of those questions. Vinnie, all yours. Thanks, Dominic. Um, so like Dominic said, for the past three days, we've been talking about democracy and how it intersects with various areas and ideas. Um, and today I'm gonna try and get at one of the core tenets of democracy, and that's actually changes to the system and to policy. Um, so to start us out, what is public policy? There really isn't one good definition of what public policy is, um, but what I've used with my students uh, is that public policy are the actions or inactions taken by governmental bodies to address some particular area of public, affair, uh, public affairs and public concerns. Uh, most typically we think of public policies as legislative, right? Congress debates an idea and passes a law and eventually it's signed by the president. Um, but policy can also come straight from the executive branch, um, either through executive orders or from rules for administrative agencies. Uh, and it can also come from the judicial branch. And this is most commonly seen through the Supreme Court decisions. But what makes public policy work? So when we start to think about policy, the first question is, is how do we actually get here? Um, and how do we go from an idea or an issue to something, some type of uh, long-term, feasible, sustainable mode of social change? And the, at the heart of it is power. Power and policy making go hand in hand with each other. Uh, public policy is all about the competition for power or the authority to control and hand out either sanctions or rewards. Um, you know, if you don't file your taxes on time, you're levied a, pen, a penalty as a sanction. Um, if you put solar panels on your house, like good for you, here's a reward. But while policy making is pretty unique. Um, ability of government alone, right? There's no one else that could force you to pay taxes. The struggle and the power struggle is held by all of us. So special interests, community organizations, community members, uh, and really politicians themselves, they all want to be control. Um, uh, and they want to be in control of what the problems are, how they're being addressed, um, and how they're being defined. And this at its core is politics. These debates are oftentimes about how we get some type of end game policy outcome. Um, and with this in mind, we have to remember that all power isn't created equally and not everyone is created equally when it comes to power. The values and opinions and ideas of some outweigh others. Uh, and those are really broken into three specific areas. The first is when we're doing policy work, it's our reliance on experts. Political leaders will rely on experts. That could be academics, it could be scientists, it could be um, people in public health. And this is really all to better align themselves with a specific definition of a problem and come to some type of decision. Uh, this is mostly used when an issue can't be used for political gain. Um, you know, we find an example is like Dr. Fauci. Uh, I don't, and no one is really going to um, benefit from not supporting a good public health response to COVID. So people are going to rely on um, Dr. Fauci's expertise. Uh, the second chunk of this, though, is that problems and policy are often defined in extremely complex terms. When an issue is hotly debated, it's really politicized, um, 
uh, we oftentimes see that the political elite and policymakers use experts to really create these complex definitions. You have to be in the know to actually understand what's going on and let alone have, a pro have an opinion and be part of the process. Um, and part of this is the use of data and really complex statistical and research techniques as the sole basis for policymaking. Um, again, we need to have, you know, you, you don't need to have a PhD in political science or have worked in the weeds for years upon years uh, to have authority on specific issues. But when we're doing policy work, that's oftentimes what we see. When we move from just uh, from, uh, from our alliance to these very complex issues. A lot of times, they're the issues that are hotly debated, they're highly politicized, and it's important to remember that experts can be abused as well. Because sometimes ex experts provide the answers that powerful interests want to hear, because they want to be seen as experts in the field, obviously, and maybe eventually um, they want to be able to do some good or they want something in return uh, when the time comes. So they create these complex problems because it, again, it makes it more difficult for the layperson to really understand what's what's happening and how they can be involved in, in the process. Um, the last chunk of this is the specific language. Using specific policy-centric or program or sector-specific language, it inherently keeps the public out of the process. And really, it's this, it's um, each of these creates the struggle for power and it can be seen as anti-democratic. These methods are intentionally keeping people out of the process. Uh, but these intentions even go a, a little bit further. Because under some circumstances, for some people, for some industries, it doesn't matter if you're actively included in the process. And this is because you're inherently more valuable within the process. In other words, power is also dictated by our values. These values are both personal and societal. Uh, there's some things that we all hold true throughout society in the, in the United States, right? Like the tenets of the First Amendment, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion. Um, we all think that they're important. But how we hold them, how we interpret these values really creates the circumstances for competition and for debate. And some people may hold values um, above others. So maybe freedom of speech isn't the most important. You know, for some people, it's issues of equity. Equity holds above all else, no matter what. We want public policies that create a more just and equal world. Um, others may think that cost is at the top, right? What is the bottom line of the policy? How much is it costing the government? Uh, what is it costing the taxpayers? And for others, it may be ideas of like individualism. And this is the most important thing to them and to public policies. Maybe the government should not infringe on an individual's right to live their life as, as they see fit. All of these are valid viewpoints. Um, and all of these lead to bigger conversations and bigger debates. But it's where they intersect, right? Where no matter our precious, our most precious values, they all determine how we view groups and people and how policies are created. Um, this is uh, from a very influential and famous article by, by the political scientist, um, uh, Anne Schneider and Helen Ingram. Uh, they're looking at the cross between construction or how people and groups are viewed, and then also the power that they hold. When we say construction, uh, we're talking about uh, you know, groups with positive construction are thought to be deserving. And we generally create policies that will have an, a positive impact on them. Um, on the flip side, we have groups that have negative construction. These groups that we see as generally bad and undeserving. Uh, they deserve bad things to happen to them and we should either create policies to reinforce this idea or we should create policies that really further punish them. These views of construction and power, they dictate a group's inclusion within the policy process and also the kinds of policies that are created. We think about AARP, right? AARP is the biggest lobbying group in the United States. But more than that, no one wants to hurt grandma and grandpa. So we're not going to create policies that uh, that will, you know, be harmful to them. Criminals, and if we even take some more specificity and say felons, they're oftentimes seen as people ill fit for public life, right? They did the crime and now they have to do the time. But more than that, there isn't a unified lobbying effort to help inmates. So when we begin to shape this out, we see that power structures can be divided up unequally. So we start to contextualize it. When we think about power and how it interacts with different groups and different constructions, politicians will take each of the contexts of how power is created um, uh, to, to then really reinforce those ideas. 
Politicians will rely on expert testimonies and research and so on when it supports older individuals because they need their support. But they'll also rely on experts for those that are viewed in a negative light, say like inmates. So they'll use expert testimony to then reinforce the status quo. When we consider the complexity of the of issues, um, it again, it, it, it falls right into place. Healthcare for children is pretty straightforward, right? All children should be covered. We need to remove barriers because, you know, the, the lives and experience that children have, um, it's, it's largely out of their control. But just the poor in general, that's an entirely different question. Why are they poor? Are they trying to lift themselves out of poverty? What have they done or have they done things in their lives that should exclude them from service overall? It's making a rather straightforward question um, and adding these technical and, com and uh, the complexities to it. Uh, that reduces the power for people to actually be able to uh, be a part of the process and, um, and obtain some positive progressive changes. And the last is this idea of, again, of specific jargon. When, uh, when we discuss issues for those with power and positive constructions, we oftentimes use terms that are straightforward and easy to understand. But when we discuss solutions about those without power and that have negative construction, Academia takes over, right? It could be super difficult to understand and follow a conversation um, because we're just throwing so much into it that we don't want everyone to be able to have an opinion and understand. So where do we go from here, right? For democratic governance to occur, for community governance to occur, we need to think through the policy process in really some new and innovative ways. And the first part of that is thinking through scale, right? Who is being affected? When we're considering solutions and even issues, we can't just rely on expert advice and we need to take a more grassroots approach. We need to spread out power within democracy, within the policy process. Policymaking should be as close to people that are impacted by an issue as possible. We need to get really the real information and insights into both the problems and the potential solutions for good policymaking to occur. Um, the next is thinking about just democracy in general. We need to be, begin to break down these traditional barriers of the policy process. We will always need expert advice. I don't think anyone would ever say that if we're making healthcare decisions, we're making health policy, we don't need to talk to nurses and doctors and public health experts. But when uh, we also uh, need to think about the individuals that are affected because the advice of affected individuals can matter just as much as expert advice because honestly, their living, their lived experience is expert advice. We need to be able to have frank uh, and open and honest conversations in ways that everyone can take part in. Um, accountability. So are our outcomes being met? If the outcomes of a policy are being met, if policymakers are taking either an anti or an undemocratic approach, they need to be held accountable. Performance must be verified. Uh, and if it's not, we need to go back and figure out why is this occurring? Where are the power dynamics? Where are the power structures? Uh, and how are people being viewed uh, that is impacting uh, whether or not we're actually getting to that end goal? And finally, we have this idea of rationality. Right. This is the only way we can change things if we know why and how decisions are being made. There must be a clear expression of values and assumptions and reasons for, for the choices that are being made. Uh, we can't accept bad policies for the poor and not know why those policies are being made. You know, the, a policymaker could say, it could be thinking it's, you know, they will pull yourself off by your bootstrap approach. Um, or it could be an issue of cost. But either way, we can compromise and find middle ground if we know those reasons. But without knowing, we, get, we just get this continuation of misinformation and really undemocratic policymaking. Um, I hope that's, I, I wanted to keep it pretty short and brief. Uh, and I hope you all began to learn something or beginning to see some of the connections between democracy and power. Um, I do wanna say that if you like this, um, if you enjoyed this and wanna be more pro a part of the process for change, I am recruiting for the summer and fall terms for the Masters of Public Policy Administration program. I'm happy to take questions and answer, um, you know, talk any more about it. So please let me know. Uh, and I think we're gonna dive into some questions now. Hey, thank you, Vinny. So um, we'll start with one question and others, feel free please to put questions in the chat. But uh, one, one of the participants um, kind of had this comment, which also I think has an embedded question. 
So the, the comment was, so we need anecdotal evidence from constituents and objective statistics from experts. Is Can you comment on that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, a lot of times um, we, we just look at the numbers and they're cut and dry and they say one thing and that's it. Uh, but really we need to take a mixed method approach to evidence and to policy making. It's not a ju enough just to have the numbers, but we need to be able to contextualize them better. And that's where qualitative information um, and I, I, I would say anecdotal evidence, but more in a structured and rigorous form um, than just a story from someone. Um, you know, uh, an, an example of this is a, a few years ago, um, I did a study on the Hispanic and Latinx community in York, and one of the data points that I, I collected uh, was on public transportation. And the question uh, was asked in a way that it gave the impression that people in the community were generally pleased uh, with how public transportation, uh, public transportation was going. Um, but what actually came out of it as a result of focus groups was that, yes, they people used it a lot, but they didn't like it. They had to use it because maybe they didn't have other modes of transportation, but they ended up waiting hours at the bus station. Um, the bus schedule was really irregular. Uh, so there was a whole lot more that went into it that just using you know, statistical analysis, the dry data doesn't get you to that final point. Um, yeah, so definitely case studies, interviews with focus groups, we need to really expand what we're discussing. Um, and again, that democratizes the process because you know not everyone will be able to perform like regression analysis um, and be able to like understand what are the different p values, uh, what are the marginal effects, how does this impact, and even our policymakers. Uh, you know, we we oftentimes will um, write policy uh, policy papers for other academics. Uh, but, you know, a lot of our policymakers are people that have just regular lived experiences. They're not in the academic world and they may not understand, uh, you know, the complexities of, you know, stats. So by including the qualitative information, by including, um, you know, you're right, the case studies, interviews, focus groups, um, and providing a much broader context of what's occurring, um, we get the whole picture and it makes a much more uh, convincing and persuasive argument of why this is actually a problem and where we can go from here. Thanks, Vinny. I have, I have a, another question for you. Um, so, you know, you, in your description, um, necessarily use lots of passive voice, like power is created and things like that. Um, but that doesn't, that kind of begs the question about who's creating it, who's in charge, what, it, yeah. what is intentional, what is not intentional. So I know that's a hard question, but yeah. I'm going to push you a little bit and see. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how that is constructed? Yeah. So, I mean, generally speaking, um, I will. Um, a few a few years ago, there was a big policy uh, that was happening at at the federal level, um, and I had a you know question about it. So I called an elected official. I'm, I'm trying to keep this as as broad and vague as I can. I called an elected official about the about the topic. Um, and their staff told me, we have no comment. We really don't know what's going on with it. Um, I, I came to find out later that this elected official was actually very much a part of the process, deeply, deeply in the weeds um, of negotiations and coming up with a final proposal. Um, and honestly, their staff just straight up lied to their constituents. Um, so, you know, when we think of this traditional policy process, it's made up by the political elites. Um, and when we go back to these three areas, right? These are the three big areas of how policy is usually made because they're not just sitting around, you know, how, you know, um, you know, just thinking through like, well, maybe this could work. They're talking to a lot of people and it's who they're talking to and the values of their experts. I'll oftentimes tell my students um, that, you know, if you have a very conservative member of Congress, that you are not going to be using like the Center for American Progress as evidence for them, because those that expert opinion just contradicts them very much so. If you have a very progressive member, you're also not going to use the Heritage Foundation because those expert opinions contradict them. So it can end up being a bit of an echo chamber of who we're talking to and what's coming out of the end uh, out of out of the end. Um, uh, but we need to really make this process open, have the discussions open and free so we all can be a part of it. 
um, and all can really provide our own insights into what we think should occur. Um, Dominic and I were in um, Liberia, oh my God, two years ago now. Um, and we were talking, we, we spoke with a whole bunch of people about maternal mortality. Um, I was taking on the, the, the policy implications of maternal mortality. Um, but, you know, when we, we went out to um, a, a rural village um, and I had a conversation with, with the chief of the village um, and he had a lot of concerns about maternal mortality. Um, he had some ideas of things that could fix it. And I asked him, has anyone ever spoken to you? And he said, no one from the government has ever come. Uh, he was chief for like 20, 25 years. No one had ever come and spoken with him. And as a, as a community leader, to not have someone speak to you when you can provide some very real, some very on the ground solutions is just a failure of the system overall. Um, so we can't just rely on that very top level hierarchical structures, um, but we need to really take the lived, experiences of, uh, the lived experiences of people into the process and by democratizing power, by, by um, expanding how people are viewed, what they're able to do, we're able to really take it from a very small group um, that maybe doesn't see the entire picture, the entire context, to something that can actually have a much broader and bigger effect. Does that answer your question, Dominic? <laughs> yeah, it does. Thank okay. you. I appreciate it. Um, so um, another question, and this is about the lack of transparency. Is the lack of transparency one of the major reasons as to why President Clinton's health reform failed? There were a million reasons why the Clinton's health reform <laughs> failed. Um, I, I think transparency could, could definitely be one of them. Uh, but uh, it was also uh, the values and um, really the expert opinions. So, you know, we oftentimes will say that we, we rely on expert opinion. Um, but again, if we don't like the expert opinion, we'll just brush it away. Um, and, I, and I say this because I, I was a really... Um, Someone that I that I know worked in the Clinton White House on their healthcare reform, and they were very they were pushing really really hard for single payer healthcare. Um, and as a health policy expert, you know they had the knowledge, the expertise, all of the credentials uh, to say yes, we should do this. But at the end of the day, it wasn't what the Clinton administration wanted to do. So you know they used the expert opinion, but then by putting it in more complex terms and saying, well, there's all these other issues that go with single payer healthcare. There's all these other issues that go along with universal healthcare. And what happens if X happens? Then we get Y. And if Y happens, we get Z. And then you know we have to deal with all these different things um, as opposed to saying, you know, people need healthcare. Here's a solution. Maybe it'll work. Um, so, you know, I think transparency is definitely one of the issues, um, but it's the reliance or under-reliance um, coupled with just the, the competition for complexity um, that, that I think we really saw. Thank you. Then there's also a question about the GameStop mm -hmm. uh, process I and mean, what's going on now around, with, around GameStop. I don't know if yeah. you're familiar with that, or not, but if you, if you are, the question is about whether that could be a current example of power and the way lobbying entities can hold power. Yeah, so um, super interesting what's happening with GameStop. Uh, they, uh, GameStop was like, I think on the verge of bankruptcy um, and a group of people on Reddit were trying to like stick it to hedge funds uh, and they just invested a ridiculous amount of money in GameStop. Um, on the, through, through the stock market. So I, it went from like $40 a share that I, I read in an article yesterday that, you know, the overnight trading, it was up to like 250 a share. Uh, so, you know, a, a really, really big jump. Uh, and what was going on was that, um, you know, people that some hedge funds and some investors that bet against the market that that GameStop uh, GameStop's uh, stock prices were going to go down. So by the increase, they all, they actually lost a lot, a lot of money. Um, I think this is an example of people taking away power um, from interest groups and from you know what we typically think as the powerful groups. Um, in a more grassroots kind of way. I, I honestly don't know enough to know if there was, you know, um, some type of background organized effort to do this. Um, but if not, if, it's, if it was just a bunch of people on Reddit saying, you know, we should really do this, um, it's, it's a great example of democratizing power. Um, 
because they were just able to, you know, all the expert advice said that these stocks were going to go bust. Uh, and here's why. We have all this modeling, all this forecasting, all in terms that quite honestly, like, I don't even know all the accounting terms, but they just ignored all that and said, you know, we should just all invest and see what happens. Um, so I think it is a really good example of power and lobbying um, and also really how things can be switched on its head pretty quickly. Thank you. And uh, just one more question, Vinny, and then we'll wrap up. And this is more of a broad question for you as an educator, as well yeah. as um, as well as in your role in public policy. Um, you know, one a lot of studies will say that students, current students, are really interested in volunteerism, doing on the ground efforts, doing those sorts of things, but want nothing to do with politics. Yeah, and, and they are they see politics as dirty business, and they don't want they don't bother to stay informed of politics or policy because they find it to be a, an area they're not interested in. What happens when the populace doesn't pay attention to politics? Yeah, so I, I, I wanna say that young people volunteer a lot. And this is going a bit off base from your question, Dominic, but young people volunteer a lot and yeah. they're very, very involved in, in, in their communities, not just here in New York, but really everywhere. Yeah. Uh, volunteerism are, are at some pretty high numbers, but there's a difference between volunteerism and then also policy work. Um, so, you know, we oftentimes volunteer because we could see that immediate result. Um, and if, you know, we go and we volunteer at a soup kitchen, we know that someone isn't hungry today. Um, what that difference is, though, between policy and volunteerism is that the policy work is looking towards that long term sustainable um, uh, changes. Um, but, you know, I think it's just all the reasons that, you know, we, we take just the, the past two weeks right? Since the beginning of January, um, we have seen a lot going on. Um, we've seen, um, you know, potential sedition at the Capitol. Um, we've seen an impeachment. Uh, we've seen an inauguration. And we've seen people really flouting the inauguration afterwards. Um, and it's, it, oftentimes, it could be seen as a really dirty, dishonest game um, that nothing gets done. People are, you know, our representatives and our elected officials aren't representing me. We can't hold them accountable. And all of that can be true. Um, but we need to move away from just saying it's too much and throwing our hands up in the air and uh, taking a more active role in the process. Um, and that can be, that could start very basically. Um, you know, while we rely on experts and while, let's just say our members of Congress rely on experts, if you and your friends feel like an issue is very important to you, um, just start showing up to your congressperson and talking to them about it, talking to their staff about it. Because eventually, like, you will become the experts in it um, and you will, you will gain the clout and the legitimacy that people, that you may not have just because you don't have, you know, some initials at the, at the end of your name. Um, and also, you know, a lot of times our elected officials, they have a really limited amount of time to think about problems, to think about solutions. Um, so if we're able to put things in simple terms and come up with simple solutions, it's much more palpable for them uh, to say like, yeah, I could get on board with that. Uh, and I could even potentially use that as a solution to it because I can understand it and I can sell that. Um, so, you know, I think that there are barriers to power that we need to overcome. Um, but there are also ways that we can all become more involved in the process to slowly whittle down those barriers. Thank you, Vinny. And, and, and I thank you for the presentation as well as the questions. Um, there's actually one more question just came up. Um, I have some stats yesterday about social media engagement of elected officials and how it skyrocketed in 2020. This seems like one way to engage younger folks in policy and politics to pretty low risk entry point. Yeah, I mean, um, for, you know, a lot of people will have faults of the Trump administration. One thing that Donald Trump did really well is connecting with people um, directly. I think his use of, tr of Twitter is just transformational for the policy and political process because never before have we had such direct um, contact and really this free and open discussions uh, with a president and just direct, right? The president can think, say, wanna say something. And instead of having to go through, you know, 10 different levels of, you know, I need to set a press conference or I need to go to the press, uh, to the, um, 
uh, to the press corps and they will report on it or a television is going to have to pick this up or whatever. He's just able to tweet it out and people are able to read it, at least until, um, you know, we can't read them anymore now. But up until that point, um, I think social media is really the, a, a huge way that we have traditionally undersold the politics and political process. Uh, and I think going forward, elected officials are going to have to depend on it more. Uh, because again, you know, when we talk about legit issues of legitimacy um, and are, do people have the authority to actually be legislating on a, on a particular issue? Uh, if there is a big enough um, uh, storm on social media, either for or against, it could sway a policy and sway decisions one way or another that we haven't seen in, in the past. Uh, just because it hasn't been as used in the past. So I, I, I really think that social media going forward is going to be a huge, huge part of campaigns, but also politicking in general. Thank you. And, and if I can go back to my, my presentation on Monday, I would tell you that people need to be trained on how to consume and use social media in, in ways that are both reasonable and thoughtful, because it can sway an election, it can sway at last minute with false information too. So there's lots of ways in which we need to be trained on how to vet information. I wanna end by first thanking Vinny for his, his time and effort today. Thanking all our panelists this week who made me proud to work at your college and really happy to be able to, uh, to work with such uh, smart and thoughtful people. And I wanna thank those of you who attended. I know many of you came to the entire series um, and some of you were able to attend at least a few of these. I wanna welcome you to tell us what we should be talking about through the Gladfelter Institute, through the Center for Community Engagement. Um, we have a storehouse of experts at your college. It's what we bring to our community is that intellectual capa uh, capacity to be able to, to do these kinds of things. So tell us, send us an email at cce at ycp.edu. It's a CCE, Center for Community Engagement at ycp.edu anytime say, hey, you wanna be talking about this or how about a series on that? And we'll continue to push out other uh, events like this. Um, if you like them, we'd love to hear more about um, you know, other ideas that you might want um, to be, uh, for us to be taking on through the, the, the large amount of experts we have at the college. So thank you, I hope you have a great rest of the day and we look forward to chatting with you again soon. Take care. <laughs>